I would say good morning, but it's a bit late to, to call it still a morning. Um, I'm going to introduce ourselves, or actually I'm going to just introduce me because you've seen Carl so, for so many times this, this conference that it's always becoming a bit boring to hear about his shameless plug about, I wrote this book, I know SGI, I work at Adobe. <laughs> We're actually in for next year. We're just uh, talking about hiring Carl as the demo guy for the conference for next year. We just don't mention him, demo guy, Carl. So uh, we both work for Adobe. Um, I'm based in Basel. He works from home in Berlin, but he's actually attached to the Basel office. Um, I'm a member of the Sling PMC. Actually, I think I've been in this role for a bit more than one year now. I'm the main contributor for the HTML reference implementation, which has been donated to Sling, I think, in 2015. I'm getting old. Um, and. A bit of trivia, the first adaptive conference that I attended, I proposed a Sling validation framework, which luckily has been uh, um, now integrated into Sling. Conrad has done a great job at um, formalizing more what I've done then, and now we can use it after, after some years. So, yeah. Carl, that's Carl. Books, PMC member, Sling, committer, doing stuff, demo guy, yeah. <laughs> now, um, let's talk about scripting. All of you are familiar with how scripting works, at least from the, from the point of mapping a URI to a resource and how you deploy your scripts to, to render something relatively simple or complex, depending on your components. But I'm curious how many of you know exactly how scripting works deep down inside of Sling. And... Um, I'm not sure if you had a time to look at it because maybe you actually didn't care because it just worked. But I started analyzing it a while back, and this is more or less how a resource mapping to a re um, sorry how a URI to a resource mapping works with all the nitty gritty details. So we're not going to talk about the URI decomposition, which is nicely explained to a diagram that's very old right now. Everybody knows the colorful one with a poster lid. We're just going to talk about how you're going to get from your URI to the script and all the steps involved. So we had a quick coffee break. Let's say that we want to get, again, a coffee from Sling. What it will happen when you're going to request your coffee is that first we're going to check which search paths are available into the system. After that, we try to look at all the possible scripts that might uh, render your resource, and we collect all of them. And it's kind of simplified here because, shameless plug, I only put some HTL scripts, but you could have tons of scripts there with different extensions mapped to different script engines. So we collect all of them. Then we filter and sort. So from, from those that are there, we actually look at the ones that actually make sense for the current request. And then sorting means that we basically grow from the most specific script to, to the most generic one. And the most generic one is provided to you by default, the Sling Get Servlet. And then we validate that that script actually exists there. We pick it, we read the script, we pass it to a script engine, no matter what that script engine is, JSP, HTL, Timeleaf, whatever. Then the script engine, I think it's going to read it again, because it does this adapt too, so then it gets a reader and it starts reading the source. And then depending on the script engine, it might evaluate or compile and execute. It's, it's a combination depending on if the script engine uh, implements compilable or not. So it's a pretty long trip from requesting something to actually getting your scripts compiled and, and executed. Now, in all this thing, we haven't been talking about dependencies or versions. And we haven't talk, been talking about them because they don't exist currently. Um, with core components, uh, which you've heard about at Last Adapt 2, and um, we're going to also have a workshop today. I think it starts at 4.30 in the afternoon. Uh, with Core Components, we try to um, implement the versioning as a segment of the resource type. And that works, but it's not very granular. So um, you, you, 
if you check the project, you see that some components are in version one, some components are in version two. So basically, you can only define major versions, but there is no way to define patch versions or minor versions. Um, those dependencies as well can only be checked at runtime. So let's say that you um, delegate something to one of the core components, or you just want to extend it. You can only figure out if your code is actually going to work correctly at runtime. There is no way to, to check if everything is going to work correctly from the beginning, from the moment that you start writing your custom component that delegates. And then, obviously, practical jokes, right? What happens if somebody actually deletes a component that you're delegating to? Or if they start changing the markup and then your component doesn't correctly uh, work with, with a component to which it delegates? There is no way to protect yourself against it at build time. Um, another aspect would be performance. So in that diagram that I showed you initially, you saw the whole trip of um, resolving a URI to an actual script that's going to render the resource. Um, for the first request, you're going to need two trips to the repository. And that's only to solve the script. And then obviously, you get to go and read the content, read the properties, assemble everything. So it, it takes a bit until, until you get your rendering. On top of that, if you haven't analyzed the code, there are at least two caches trying to keep things snappy in the in Sling. One is the servlet resolver cache, which I think caches uh, servlets or scripts because Scripts are considered servlets as well. There, there's this adaption mechanism. And then a while back, I think two years ago, I implemented a script cache which was mostly designed for compilable script engines. So if a script engine implements compilable, it would just save for the first execution the compilable object. And then this compilable object has this method called evaluate. And instead of recompiling everything, we just pass uh, the bindings or a script context to this evaluate method. But everything happens behind the scenes. and I think you all know this joke about um, yeah, the two hard things in computer science, or three, or how many we have. It's, it's tons of variations. But most importantly, cache invalidation is a bitch. Uh, there are so many factors that you have to take uh, into consideration. Uh, you have to do proper eviction. You have to make sure that your cache doesn't expand beyond your control. And um, it's just too much work to do um, when you could actually get everything for free. Now, I want to make the session just a bit interactive. Um, and I'm going to ask you to raise your hands, make me feel like a rock star, if you agree or you don't agree with, with the following statements. What do you think that scripts are? Who's, who's for content? Raise your hand. <laughs> Is that you, David? No. So I saw one hand. Who thinks that scripts are code? More of you. Nice. Um, are scripts authored, or are they developed? Authored. Who's for authored? Nobody. Who's for developed? Almost all of you. Nice. Can we use those scripts freely, or do they have a constraint? Are they, do they have a context? So who's for freely now? Nobody. Who's for having a constraint to run those scripts? Again, almost everybody. Yay, I'm right. Carl, too. <laughs> Now, if scripts are code, then why do we treat them differently? Why don't we assemble scripts like code should be assembled? Why do we keep considering them content, which obviously is going to create headaches when we upgrade an instance or we, when we upgrade a, a project that provides scripts? We know how to deal with code. Code is actually pretty simple to work with, right? It provides or implements an API. In the case of scripts, this one is an HTTP API. The code evolves semantically, and I have to actually explain what semantically means in case of scripts. So with core components, we try to define this. Um, I think it's three or four layers for what, what semantic means there. You have this markup right, for, for a script. And then the markup that it outputs, it has to be semantically the same if you want to uh, provide some compatibility. So what that means is that somebody doesn't have to change the selectors to work with your updated version of the component. Once they have to do that, then you're basically generating a new version of the component. Then obviously, if we're talking about integrating models into that code, so sling models in this case, again, that API is kind of controlled, because we're talking about a Java API. But as soon as you change the interface that you want for a model into the script, you're basically, again, pushing a new major version of, of, of that script. 
Um, same for dialogue. So at core components, we said, okay, how can we make sure that we don't break dialogues for, for our developers? And then we said, okay, we can only guarantee tab um, compatibility or consistency. So then if somebody starts extending a core component, then the only way to make semantical um, and backwards compatible changes would be if they would group their custom properties into a new tab rather than try to customize this. So although we cannot make scripts, uh, we cannot check the, um, sorry, the, the development of scripts in a semantical way with tools, we could technically enforce some patterns so that somebody who consumes your scripts know exactly what to expect when you change a patch version or a minor version or a major one. And in code, right, in, in the Java world at least, but also in, in, in JavaScript or anything else, code is a cohesive unit, right? It, it evolves naturally and it's managed by one or more developers, but it's one unit. Now, we thought about um, bridging this, the, these two concepts, right? So code and scripts, and uh, that's how Apache Sync Scripting Reloaded uh, yeah, got, got born. And we basically combined OSGI and scripts, and we're going to uh, allow the OSGI resident expert to continue with the presentation. <laughs> Didn't start the timing again. Um, Who needs a timer? <laughs> exactly. So, um, yeah, in a, as Vado mentioned, though, the, the, the history is, is exactly this, that, that he, he and I got together and he had this idea of, you know, can we, can we improve upon the situation and up to a point can we somehow deliver this as bundles. And at, the, at that time, we um, had some discussions of what, what would be the benefits and, the, and what would potentially be you know, downsides of, of an approach like this. But it also happened, and that's sort of related to the talk we just had, which is a feature model, but just in general, um, the changing environment where it becomes more important in, in, a, in a certain way that we can ahead of time um, see if a system is going to be able to run, that we can assemble it from what it requires and, and, and what it provides, you know, that we have a better understanding by just looking at the definition of the system we're going to start or run um, if it is actually complete, right? So, and, and so we, we, we sort of determined that, that maybe the, the thing to start with is resource types, Right, because in, in Sling, that's that's the main mechanism how how you dispatch stuff, how you find things, and how um, yeah um, scripts and and servlets and everything works together. But there's no way to really express that you require a certain resource type. Right, that's that's it's just not it's just not mecha no mechanism to do that. Right. So um, what would be a good way to address that? Situation and and uh, preferably do so in a in a potentially even versionable way and well I mean quite obviously I mean OSGI is is something that wires up things you know and can express these kind of things and I'm not sure how many are of you are really familiar with that part but um, I mentioned it in the feature model talk too um, we have this generic capability and requirement model in OSGI it came a little later than the than the actual import package and, and export package things. So these headers are still around, but um, um, already nowadays for the actual resolve, we sort of translate import packages into requirements and, and export packages into capabilities, and then we do the resolver. So the resolver works on a more general concept, which is capabilities and requirements. Right? So we have a generic model um, where you can express capabilities and you can ex um, express requirements. And um, uh, then we have a resolver that works with this, you know, and it actually is part of any framework, so your bundles can have requirements and capabilities, right? And, and th these get matched up, so your bundle will not resolve if your requirements are not matched, right? Um, just uh, like with import and export packages, they can be versioned, and you have a filter um, that you can give to, uh, 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 to make it even more specific if you want to match specific attributes of those. So we, we sort of opted to, okay, well, let's, let's put scripts into bundles um, and make them versioned. How could that look, right? And then um, just zooming into the 
the image we had before. Well, um, in this case, well, we would still have a resource mapping, obviously, which goes to the resource and that tells us the, the string resource type. So that part stays the same. Um, and then the, the, the resource type mapping actually stays the same. It just finds a servlet, you know, which is, which is published with you know, the resource types, the selectors, and, and, and the extension, and all the things you know. Um, but it's based on a bundle, which just internally contains scripts, um, and they need to be contained in a certain layout. You know? So we expect it to be in a Java script uh, folder, and then it's followed by the resource type name as the directory. Um, in this case, it's Coffee Maker. And then um, you give a version. Right, so this bundle provides scripts for coffee maker resource type in version one one for one, um, and then well, starting from there, it's it's what you normally know from Sling, which is just the normal Sling layout. So you have you know the the, the, the name, the extension, and and selectors and stuff like that encoded in the in the pass name. So so it's sort of something that hooks into the middle of what normally happens. Right, the normal part would be that you have in your repository the things that are in the bundle below the version. Right? But the other stuff comes on top of it, right? so it's a injected version. Um, so when, when we get a resource mapping, well then, okay, we can look into this bundle, select the right script, um, give it to a script engine, it compiles it and gives us back an uh, executable unit and it can be you know, executed. So we can hook into this process because of the flexibility of Sling um, without changing anything of Sling. Right? We just publish a real servlet for it um, with the right extensions, and then we hook into it and do it. We can take it over as a pure add-on. Um, the other option we, we added is that now that we have a bundle, well, we can also um, provide not the scripts, but just have the scripts be pre-compiled as classes already. So everything else in this picture pretty much stays the same on the left-hand side. Um, in the bundle layout, too, it's just the same um, names, but it's classes now, so they're pre-compiled. In this case, while well, obviously we, we save quite a bit, we can just select the class and execute. Um, we do cache the instances that we execute from the engine, but um, it's just, you know, we don't have the whole startup hit when you first do it. You know. um, and then, okay, that was how the scripts get delivered, pre-compiled or not, um, and how they hook into the system, well, with these servlets, which we register for you, for you I said. So how do we do that? Right. So um, that's where it gets a little bit more complicated, but actually not that much. So if we, if we look at a, at, a, at a bundle coffee maker that provides those coffee maker scripts we've just seen um, in uh, its JavaScript area um, for the resource type coffee maker in a certain version, it has to actually, all it has to do, by and large, is, uh, it has to express a, um, a requirement on an OSGI extender. That's our bundle to say, OK, I want to be you know, interpreted by you. And um, it sits in the middle. Um, it provides a capability for it. And then the uh, extender comes along, sees this bundle, and will register matching servlets with the matching Sling meta uh, data on, uh, on it uh, for the you know, resource type and the extension, stuff like that. So these are the upper blue, sort of blue, um, servlets we see there. Um, it, however, if you, if, you, if you would count real quick, you see we only have seven scripts, but we have a lot more, seven, lot more servlets here in blue. Well, that's because we basically uh, will register the resource type once with the version, and then a pure resource type without the version. And the, the pure one, where we sort of take the version away, we maintain that list, so we, we will delegate the pure one to the highest version that is available at the moment. So if you have two providers of the same resource type in two different versions, we have a third servlet which will pick the one with the higher version. So this way we can do um, uh, uh, both. We can provide a normal resource type plus a version resource type. And you can either pick the version one if you know what you want, or you just take the general one and get the highest version script that you can find. Okay. And then we have an extension mechanism where, where the bundle Latte art maker can come along. Um, it just provides one extra strip, script, and it obviously has to require the extender, but it also <coughs> requires the resource type coffee maker from somebody else in a given version range. So it will only resolve if its parent bundle or the one, it, you know, the coffee maker is there because it cannot work standalone. It expresses, I, I need a coffee maker, right? So um, that is what the OSGI framework will take care of automatically. It will not resolve if nobody provides it. 
if we have the other bundle around, well, the bundle tracker comes along, sees that, and will register a servlet for or servlets for the um, latter art maker resource type, one for it without the version and one with the version, right? But what's about the other green servlets? Well, these we sort of synthesize out of this because we can see, well, you extend this, so you're sort of looking for a super type, and that super type provides even more extensions for, 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 the, for this thing. So uh, we synthesize those but delegate to the other one. So this is, this is a mechanism where you really can say, I extend it, and I, but I extend only this one script, this one part of it. The all other extensions I inherit. Right? If you would provide more extensions which match, we move that down and, and away from there. So that's a, we have an extension mechanism already that, that, that does that in, in the normal case, um, but, but here we can express it a little nicer because we have the real dependency for it. Basically. It's more or less linked resource super type on steroids in the sense right. that it's using the extends concept, which uh, is quite familiar to a Java developer. And it nicely takes all the version information into account as well. So if you had one which was available in several versions and you extend it, well, it still you know, mitigates sort of correctly for the, at least for, for some cases we tried. Um, right, so as a last thing, just to have that out here a little bit more clearer. So how does the capability look? We've seen the requirement, but um, the, you know, all that the bundle need basically on top of the script is that they say, okay, I, I, you know, I provide this resource type and I do it for potentially methods or extensions or whatever that, that we can generate with the Maven plugin uh, if you want to, but you can restrict it via this one as well, and we can give a version for it. So once you do that and you require the extender, it will register your servlets um, for the scripts. So that's, that's the main idea. Give or take. <laughs> give or take. So what we developed actually is a new resolver, which is a, an add-on module. It doesn't provide any API. You just wire to it with those capabilities that Carl explained before. You basically declare your bundle as a bundle providing scripts, and then you just um, create a require capability to, to this other bundle. Then you basically, when you install your uh, bundle that provides scripts into the platform, you create the wiring. And then this um, add-on module, which is essentially a bundle tracker, is just going to check your bundle and then start exposing those servlets for you. Um, we use the already established uh, mechanisms for registering servlets in Apache Sling. So basically, the bundle tracker for each capability that it sees from a bundle is just going to register a, a regular Sling servlet. So there's nothing fancy about that. Um, the mechanism allows you to build more lightweight instances that you can throw into production with very little warm-up when it comes to scripts. Because if you use the pre-compiled scripts, then um, the first request is just going to find the class and execute it. And after that, we just have that instance already there cached for you into the servlet. And then we just basically run and evaluate, depending on the type of the script engine. Um, on some tests that, I, that I've done, on, actually, on this laptop, uh, for the first request on a just started system, if you use a pre-compiled script, you're going to get uh, the first response 10 times faster than if you had been using regular scripts into the repository. After this, so after all the caches kind of get warmed up into the system, the difference is negligible. They're, they both perform the same because they use the same mechanism. So it's a cache servlet which just gets executed. Um, the, the bundle that we provide us, so this Sling Scripting Resolver, for lack of a better name now, it's in whiteboard anyway, so the name is not, uh, is not final. Uh, it provides you with a mechanism for deploying truly versionable scripts to this, uh, through this require provide mechanism. And you have explicit dependencies uh, because you, you, you create a require capability. You say, okay, I can only um, um, execute my stuff into this context where another resource type is available uh, with this filtering for a version type uh, and, um, and, and version. We, if we would switch from the current model to exclusively using this new scripting resolver, we would remove the need of a script cache because everything gets cached into the servlets that we deploy uh, automatically for the bundles that provide scripts, and then the framework basically takes care of maintaining everything for you. So if you take down a bundle that was providing scripts, everything that was registered with that bundle context is going to be unregistered from, from the platform. And, and Felix does a pretty good job at, at, at doing this for you. So 
uh, we basically optimize Sling if we would switch from, from the current model. Uh, alternatively, we just install this, this um, scripting resolver as an add-on, and then the two models can coexist without any problem. Um, we provide a mechanism to remove additional pressure from the persistence layer. Scripts are not content. They should not be in the content. Um, we simplify instance upgrades. So all of you have, or most of you have gone through, through some upgrade processes when you had to migrate from 6.0 AM to, to a different version. And then you had problems with components or with selectors that were not behaving the same. Because right now, if you have, um, with this model, if you have the provide and require capabilities, you know in advance if your uh, current code is still going to work on, the, on a new platform. And you find this out at, at build time, as long as you have the proper dependency in your class path. Um, and because provide and require capabilities are kind of difficult to write, the syntax is not the nicest one, but they do the job. Um, we wrote a Maven plugin that, based on the structure of your project, it generates the provide and require capabilities. And then you just add this plugin to your Palm, add some properties into the uh, Maven bundle plugin configuration so that they generate the correct require and provide capability headers, and then you're all set. And then use uh, uh, the plugins that you are familiar with, so the Maven Sling plugin, Maven bundle plugin, HTML Maven plugin if you want to compile, or JSPC uh, Maven plugin if you want to compile. So um, it, it's not such a big overhead to switch from one, one model to the other. And now the time to embarrass ourselves on stage. Hopefully not. So I built a very simple um, application where we have the coffee maker and the latte art maker. Um, I don't have as many scripts as we had on the diagrams because I don't need all of them, but I do have some delegation there. So um, let's, let me show you quickly the, the project structure to understand what scripts I have here. So these are the scripts that I provide. Uh, the coffee maker has its main script, a head, a medium, a style, and a text HTML script. And then the latte art maker uh, just has style and text, and an extends file. That extends file is our mechanism for Sling resource super type, and that's how we define uh, what resource type you extend. We partly use the require capabilities syntax. So you see that the latte art maker requires coffee maker resource type with a version range. So that's how, based on this file, we generate the required capabilities from the Maven plugin. And then if I go back to my demo and I check what the latte art maker is going to render, you're going to see that it delegates stuff to the coffee, uh, coffee maker resource type, but it also provides um, its, own, um, its own script to, to override stuff. So in this case, you see that the latte art maker overrides the text selector. And this happens with, with compiled scripts. Um, now, to show you what would happen if I would change the coffee maker, I'm just going to change the version type from 1 to 0 to 2 0 0, so a breaking change. So let's go to the coffee maker. I'm just going to change the resource type, with it, which in this case is just a convention on the file system. I install the updated coffee maker. And now I switch to the window where I have the, with the logs. And this red message here is an error. So Latte Art Maker now cannot start anymore. And the reason for that is that it, ex it expects a coffee maker, but only with that resource type version. So in between 1.0.0 and 2.0.0, but basically less than 2.0.0. So everything becomes way more predictable. Now, if I would switch the coffee maker not back to, to, the, version, uh, to the version that it had, but maybe just I, I do a minor um, upgrade. So instead of switching from 2.0.0 to, let's say, 1.9.0, reinstall it. And then I have to go to the Sling web console because the Latte R Maker is not going to start automatically anymore, but I just have to uh, manually start it. I go back to the Latte R Maker, 
and I see that it now delegates to the 190 version of the coffee maker. So everything is handled super, super nicely. That was the embarrassing moment. Luckily, it went OK. Now, future plans. Um, we don't have yet the same workflow for developers when you write a script. So we don't quickly deploy the other script. You have to deploy the whole bundle to see your updates. But a mechanism to provide the same functionality should be super easy because we already have the tooling in place. We just have to maybe deploy a module on the instance that assembles the bundle, the updated bundle automatically for you and redeploys it. And this you'd use only in a development scenario so that you have a quick update of the script on the file system and then a sync on, onto the instance. Um, additionally, it would be interesting to actually add a module to the Slink starter application and maybe convert one of the, the sample applications that we have to the, to the model where it uses precompiled scripts and the, the scripting resolver. Um, on AM, things are a bit more complicated because we have to figure out how to expose dialogues and edit configurations, which right now are content details, so it's a content structure. But I guess with a new approach, we would have to expose them somehow as a model, and then AEM would have to understand them and render the dialogues and provide information about the edit configuration, the components for you. And that's a wrap. Do you have questions? Any questions? I think we have two, at least, or one. No. No? Okay. Good. Then thank you, Radu and Carl, for your presentation.